Should we start? Sure. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. All right, thank you all for uh, coming. We'd like to start the RI seminar series for, for fall of 2012, and we're very honored to have uh, with us as our inaugural speaker, uh, Professor Stephen Chase. Uh, he has a joint appointment at the CNBC, uh, which is the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition, and the Biomedical Engineering Department at uh, CMU. He did his PhD at Johns Hopkins, and joined as a postdoc at CMU in 2006. And he's been an assistant professor since 2011. He does a lot of interesting work. And I'm not going to attempt to you know, coalesce it into a story, but uh, it's, it's largely to do with coding uh, the, the end flow of information in the brain. Right? Uh, lots of interesting work, and we look forward to the talk. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. And, uh, Excited to kick off the series. Um, so as the title implies, I'm going to talk a, a lot about uh, neural prosthetics. Uh, and the idea behind neural prosthetics is, is, is pretty simple. Uh, so we have a patient uh, who's spinal cord injured or suffers from some other motor disorder where the brain is entirely intact, but for whatever reason, they can't communicate signals uh, to the muscles and actually interact with the external world. And what we would like to do is design a device that can read out motor intention signals or some kind of intention signal from the brain and then use that signal to directly actuate either a cursor on a computer screen or a robotic arm, something like that, and restore the ability for these patients to interact with the external world. And so a, a typical schematic of a neural prosthetic system looks something like this. You have a, a patient. Uh, that patient generates some kind of motor intention signal. That intention signal flows down into primary motor cortex and drives the activity of neurons in primary motor cortex. And so what we do is we record from those neurons using chronically implanted microelectrode arrays. These are typically, they're called Utah arrays. There's 100 uh, channels on them. And we can record from roughly about 100 neurons in primary motor cortex. And if we know how those neurons represent motor intent, we can then design a decoder to infer what that motor intent is and directly use that to drive, say, a, a cursor on a computer screen or a robotic arm. And then the subject sees that resultant movement and closes the loop, generates a new intent signal to try and drive that device to, to, to perform the action he's, he's trying to do. So really, the only difference between these kinds of devices and the kinds of devices that you and the robotics community are used to working with is the fact that we have actually a live subject in the loop. And this is a blessing and a curse for us. It's a, it's a blessing because it means that we can spend a lot less time dividing, uh, d designing things like intelligent planning algorithms because we have that in the loop already. It's a curse because, unfortunately, we don't really understand how that intelligent planning algorithm is working. And so a lot of times, our decoding approaches aren't actually appropriate for what the, the subject is doing. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what one of these uh, devices actually looks like in action. This is a, a video released uh, by the Schwartz Lab back in 2008. And they have a monkey implanted with one of these uh, Utah electrode recording arrays. It's uh, recording about 100 neurons in primary motor cortex. And they're using those signals to drive this robotic arm. And the monkey is controlling both the 3D endpoint position of the robotic arm as well as the 1D gripper aperture of the arm. And when you have a highly motivated subject, as this monkey is because he really loves marshmallows, then the subject can learn to use this device to do something useful like feed himself marshmallows. And so, so what you may not know is that is, is, is how that device works. And the basis of control behind that device was something called the population vector algorithm. So I'll explain what that does. Sort of the basis of all prosthetic control is, is, is if we're going to tap motor intent signals out of the motor cortex, we need to understand how those neurons are representing intent. And uh, a lot of what we understand about how that works comes from a series of studies started by Georgopoulos back in 1982. And what Georgopoulos did is he had monkeys perform reaching movements using a using their arm and they perform it, uh, what they call a center outreaching task where he'll, he'll have his arm in the center of a workspace and then he'll make movements to targets equally spaced on a, on a circle around the outside. And Georgopoulos recorded single neurons in primary motor cortex while monkeys performed this task. And he just looked at, at their firing rates. And what he found is that when the movement was in certain regions of space, that neuron would fire quite a lot. And when the movement was in other regions of space, down in the lower corner there, the, 
the neuron would stop firing. And in fact, if you plot the firing rate as a function of the angle of movement, actually a lot of neurons exhibit this nice cosine tuning curve. And so uh, we see, uh, now this is actually a relatively surprising finding because until this time, people thought neurons in primary motor cortex really were there uh, what their job was was to drive muscles directly and so you'd expect that the, the firing rates of neurons would be more uh, related to things like the force that the muscle was generating or to things like the torques that the joints were generating and these are relatively complex multi-joint movements but what Georgopoulos found is that we could actually describe the activity of the neurons using a relatively simple code just the direction of movement in extrinsic space which makes doing something like inferring direction of movement much much simpler so these cosine tuning curves can be parameterized by three numbers. The first is denoted in red here. It's the preferred direction of the neuron. That's the direction of movement that this neuron is most responsive to. The second in green is the modulation depth of the cell, which describes its dynamic range of modulation. And the third is its average firing rate, what we call the baseline activity of the cell. So the way, so the first thing I should mention is that cosine tuning all it is is linear tuning, all right? And to understand that, we can write a linear equation on the board where if the firing rate of the cell is just some linear function of coefficients times the direction of movement, dx and dy, in 2D space, and we can rearrange this equation and draw it out in vector form where we have a vector b of b coefficients, and then we have the direction vector. And if we, the direction vector is automatically a unit vector, if we rescale that coefficient vector to be a unit vector by taking a scalar length component, the modulation depth, it turns out, outside, then you can see when we take the dot product of these two unit vectors, what we get is the cosine of the angle between them. And so cosine tuning is really a statement that a lot of neurons in the brain linearly encode the direction of movement. And this is also nice for the design of algorithms because most of our algorithms assume linear encoding. So the way the population vector algorithm works in a nutshell is that we record from these neurons, and we sample how often they're firing spikes over some small window of time, say 30 milliseconds. So we count the number of spikes it fires over that 30 millisecond bin, divide by the time, that gives us a firing rate. Now we normalize those rates by subtracting off the baseline firing rate and dividing by the modulation depth of the cell. So that gives us a normalized estimate of that neuron's firing rate which is very noisy because it's been taken over 30 milliseconds. And so what we do is we smooth that estimate by taking a running average of it over the last five time bins, the last 150 milliseconds, and that gives us a smoother estimate, still relatively fast, of that neuron's firing rate. And then what we do is we use that smooth, normalized firing rate to weight the length of a vector that points in that cell's preferred direction. And the idea here is that the more this cell fires, the longer that vector is going to be, the longer that vector that points in its preferred direction is going to be. And then, as the name population vector average implies, what we do is we take the average of all those little vectors. We add them up in space, and the resultant vector we scale it by some constant ks to turn it into units of velocity, and that is the velocity of the thing we're going to actuate, be it a robotic arm or be it a cursor on a computer screen. And then we just add those vectors up tip to tail. We integrate them to get the position of those devices. So that is how the population vector algorithm works. Now, there are a lot of good reasons why it should not actually be a good algorithm for driving a prosthetic device. So the first of these is that I told you that a lot of neurons are cosine tuned. They have that linearly related to the direction of movement. Well, it turns out that's not quite right. And the reason it's not quite right is because neurons can't have negative firing rates. And so a lot of time what they show is this rectification behavior where when the movements go in the opposite direction, they fall off of that linear line. So they're not quite linearly tuned. And also, I've told you that they tend to follow these cosine tuning curves. It turns out when you measure that very, very accurately, like Amerikian and Georgopoulos did back in 2000, what you find is that instead of having a half width of 90 degrees like you would expect from a cosine tuning curve, a lot of times those half widths are actually about 60 degrees. So they're narrower than cosine on average. The third problem with the PVA is it assumes that your tuning curves are stationary. And it turns out that tuning curves can change for a lot of reasons. And so this is an experiment that was done by, by Rockne et al. back in 2007, and where they just had a monkey perform these center outreaching tasks for an hour. 
And then they divided the session up into the first 20 minutes and the last 20 minutes, and they measured tuning curves for those 20 minutes, and they compared them. And what they found is that they got significant changes in the tuning curves of most of the neurons they recorded. So these tuning curves tend to drift around over time for various reasons. And the final reason why the population vector algorithm shouldn't actually work as well as it does is because as a statistical estimate of direction, it's actually a terrible. Uh, and it's terrible because it's a biased estimator. And you can see that it's biased by just playing this little thought experiment. So assume you have two neurons who are perfectly cosine tuned. So you have one neuron, the blue neuron here, which has a preferred direction of zero degrees directly to the right. And you have a second neuron that has a preferred direction of 45 degrees, sort of up and to the right. And let's say those are the only two neurons you're recording from and you're trying to drive a cursor on a computer screen. Now, when the subject is trying to aim directly to the right, he's going to activate that first neuron. It's going to fire above its baseline firing rate because that's in that neuron's preferred direction. He's also going to activate the second neuron because it's close to that neuron's preferred direction. And so both of them are going to have positive contributions to the population vector average. And the resultant movement is going to be not directly to the right, but it's going to be a little bit up and to the right. And you can play this game, assuming he's trying to aim at points all the way around that circle. And what you get are that the movements that actually result tend to be clustered along the axis that describes the majority of tuning curves of those neurons. So it's a biased algorithm. So how is it possible? Like I showed you in the video, the monkey was able to feed himself, and it seemed like without too much trouble. How is that possible? And the reason that's possible is because the brain adapts. And so what I showed you about that rectification behavior, under hand control, when the monkey's making these reaching movements, yes, it's true. These neurons deviate from linearity. But it turns out if you take the same neurons and you measure them in a context when the monkey's actually using the prosthetic device, a lot of times those neurons look far more linear. And in fact, if you look across time while the monkey trains with that prosthetic device and you measure the tuning curves of those neurons when he's making natural reaching movements and then you take the same neurons and measure their tuning curves when he's using the device and you compute the R squares of those two linear fits, in their brain control, the R squared of that linear fit increases over time. And in fact, if you take the difference between the brain control R squared and hand control R squared, it shows a sharp increase over, over the course of months. And the result seems to be that the longer the subject uses a decoder that assumes the neuron should be linear, the more linear those neurons become. So now I mentioned to you that the population vector algorithm is a biased estimator. Now this was mentioned to Valiste et al. when they submitted their paper to Nature. And the reviews went something like this, and I'm paraphrasing, but something like, it's a shame that you all use the population vector algorithm. The population vector algorithm is provably mathematically inferior, and it would have been nice to have seen how good the control would have been had you used a more reasonable decoding algorithm. And it's true. You can prove that the PVA is biased. And the way you can prove it yourself, you can prove it mathematically using that thought experiment like we did. Or you can take neurons that you record while the monkey is making an actual reaching movement with his arm. And then you can invert that problem and try and predict where that arm was at every instant in time. And you can do that prediction using the population vector algorithm. And you can do that prediction using the optimal linear estimator, which is a, an unbiased version of the same thing. And for this offline trajectory reconstruction case, the OLE, the optimal linear estimator, outperforms the population vector algorithm every time, significantly. But the question is, how well do they compare online? So we did an experiment where we had a monkey push a cursor around in 2D using a population vector algorithm. And then after he'd done that for a while, after he'd made 15 reaches to each of our eight targets, we changed it on him without telling him in the middle between two reaches. We changed the decoding algorithm on him to the optimal linear estimator. We had him use it for 15 reaches to each of those targets. And then we'd switch it back and that sort of thing. And what I'm showing you here are the trajectories from every one of the reaches in that experiment. His success rate, by the way, through this experiment was 100%. So changing the decoder on him in the middle didn't slow him down at all. And just looking at these, you'd be hard pressed to tell me which was the biased decoder and which was the unbiased decoder. So it could be that for this particular sample of neurons we had, 
it didn't happen to have a lot of bias in it. Maybe the preferred directions were nicely uniformly distributed or something like that. It turns out that's not the case. And to show that, we can take the same firing rates when the monkey is using the population vector algorithm, and we can decode them offline using the optimal learner estimator. And what you get are the trajectories shown here, which show those characteristic biased curves. Most of those trajectories are missing the targets in characteristic directions. And you can do that for the same the, for the firing rates when the subject was using the optimal learner estimator, if we decode those firing rates using the population vector algorithm, we get that same bias in the opposite direction. And so what it's looking like is that the subject is able to compensate for the bias in this decoder, and he does it nearly instantly. All right. So the point here is that offline, the mean squared error of our reconstructed arm movements is equivalent to the bias squared plus variance. You can break it down in those ways. But it looks like online, subjects can compensate for that bias. And the point here is that offline estimates of how well an algorithm will perform do not necessarily translate into online performance gains. Or, thinking about it a little bit more broadly, this severely changes how we ought to think about designing our decoding algorithms. Now, usually the first thing we think as statisticians or as, or as you know, anybody who, who does mathematics, the first thing you think about when you're trying to design an estimator is you're trying to, to design an unbiased estimator. It tends to be the first thing we do. And what this results show us is that maybe we need to expand our thinking and, and, and not immediately rule out the class of unbiased estimators, or the class of biased estimators that's actually out there. OK. So this talk is going to be broken down roughly into two parts. So the first part, I'm going to describe some of the research we've done to try and understand these learning processes that happen while a subject is, is using a brain-computer interface to see if we can sort of understand if there are limitations to those learning processes, or perhaps understand how to design a decoder that it might better take advantage of those learning processes. And the second part of the talk, is I'm going to talk about a new decoding approach that we use that appears to, to give uh, improved cursor control. So how do we investigate learning in our brain-computer interfaces? And, and the way people, uh, as psychophysicists especially, investigate learning in the lab is by using things like visual motor rotations and visual motor gains. And so visual motor rotation, we're all relatively familiar with this. When you go to grab your mouse and you don't grab it quite right and you push it straight forward, let's say you grab it at an angle, what happens is the cursor doesn't move straight, straight up on the screen. It moves off at an angle. Now, most of us would just readjust our hand and do it. But if you were to keep using the mouse at that odd angle, you would learn the direction in which to push the mouse in order to make the cursor move in the direction you want. It turns out humans are very, very good at adapting to visual motor rotations. A visual motor gain is a similar thing, except when I move my arm six inches, if there's a positive gain, say, of a factor of two, the cursor on the screen would move 12 inches. Or if it was a negative gain factor, if I move my arm six inches, the cursor on the screen would only move three inches. And it turns out humans are also very, very good at figuring out what distance of movement to make in order to, to make the cursor move where they want. So we're very good at adapting to visual motor rotations and visual motor gains. So the way we apply these kinds of perturbations in BCI is, again, through the population vector algorithm. Now remember in the population vector algorithm, the way it works is that if you have a bunch of neurons, he's aiming at a target over here. He's recruiting neurons that have preferred directions in that way. He's increasing their firing rates. That leads to long vectors pointing that. And when we average them, we typically get a velocity vector that points towards that target, if we decode correctly. But what we can do is instead of having those neurons push the cursor in the direction that they naturally represent, we could have those neurons push the cursor in a different way. And so what we do is we take a random subset of those cells and we rotate the direction in which they push the cursor. All right? This results in two phenomena. First, you'll notice that the cursor isn't moving in the correct direction. It's moving at a rotated angle relative to the intended direction of movement. So that's the visual motor rotation we apply. And the second thing you'll notice is now, because the population that he's using is dispersed, the average vector is shorter than it was before. And since the average vector is proportional to the speed of the cursor, what that does is it imposes a visual motor gain reduction as well. All right, so this is a very odd sort of perturbation to do. Why did we do this particular perturbation? And the reason we did this kind of perturbation, where we randomly chose some subset, is that we wanted to ask the question, if only certain neurons are contributing to error in this system, can the subject identify which neurons are contributing to error and selectively just change their behavior? Or 
does he have to address the entire neural population as a group? So we wanted to ask the question, can the subject solve the credit assignment effect? So we did multiple versions of this experiment where we chose populations, randomly chose populations of either 50% or say just 25% of the neurons to perturb. And we changed the amount of rotation we applied to their decoding directions. So sometimes it was 30 degrees, sometimes it was 60 degrees or 90 degrees. And we did all different forms of these. And you can compute from first principles what the visual motor rotation and the visual motor gain reduction will be under each one of these manipulations. And so we tested a bunch. And this is what those, uh, those, an experiment looks like in real time. So what I'm showing you here is the control session we run beforehand to get the monkey familiar and just pushing the cursor around. And you'll see during control, he's very, very good at making straight movements towards that target. His movement time is roughly less than a second, which includes his reaction time. Now in a second, you're going to see two things. You're going to see that solid cursor, which is what the monkey sees, and you're also going to see this ghosted cursor, which is what would have happened had we not perturbed the system. The monkey doesn't get to see that. But you'll notice that that ghosted cursor shoots straight towards the target. Meanwhile, the real cursor moves off at an angle, and the monkey is able to visually guide that cursor to hit the target. So his success rates don't drop much during this experiment. But he ends up making these curved trajectories. Now, these are the results of this experiment after the subject has had 200 to 300 trials of experience with this. And now what you'll notice is that that solid cursor, the real cursor, is moving straight towards the target and that ghosted cursor is the one that's missing. So he adapts to these visual motor rotations quite well. So this is just the average trajectories from all the experiments in which we took 50% of the neurons and rotated them by 60 degrees. And you'll notice that those average trajectories point pretty straight to the target. And we can assess the error in the movement, the angular error, by looking at the angular deviation from a straight line to the target at the halfway point, at that dotted circle. And so in the control session, that average angular error is very close to zero degrees. And the average time to tar target is a little bit less than a second. After we apply that perturbation in the early part of the perturbation, it's the first movement to every target, we get these pinwheel effects where the cursor initially moves off in the wrong direction and then he visually steers it into the target. The average angular error in that case was roughly 22 degrees and the average time to target increased to over a second. And then after he uses that for roughly one, uh, 200 to 300 trials, you'll see that the angular error reduces and the time to target drops a little bit. And then we turn the perturbation off. And what happens when we turn the perturbation off is we get the opposite effect. Now he's used to working with this perturbed system, and so his movements are now inappropriate for an unperturbed system, and so you get these pinwheel effect that goes in the other direction, and that also reduces over time. And if we look at the learning curve in this system, we just take the expected angular error, which is that average error there, and we plot that as a function of time, we see that those angular errors reduce as a function of time, where after about 300 trials, now the error is down to about 30% of what it is on trial number one. So he adapts to these visual motor rotations quite well. What about the gain reductions? Well, we can take the speed of the cursor and plot that as a function of what we expect the speed should be from first principles just due to the perturbation that we applied. And what you'll notice is that most of these points are above the diagonal, which indicates that the cursor is moving faster than it would be if he hadn't done anything to speed it up. So this adaptation happens very, very rapidly. You see it already on the second trial of the system. So he adapts very quickly to the speed reduction. But that adaptation has a very limited dynamic range. So remember I said we did several versions of this experiment where we applied different amounts of rotation which result in different amounts of vision motor gain, a reduction. And as we apply more and more vision motor gain reduction, as the, as the apply vision motor gain gets further towards zero, these black bars represent what, how fast he would have to push the cursor in order to return it back to its normal speed. So how hard he'd have to push it. It's the gain that he needs to respond with. And the gray bars represent the gain that he actually responds with. And he very rarely is able to speed this, uh, to, to push the cursor hard enough in order to compensate fully for the gain reduction we applied. OK, so that's what happens in the behavioral effects. What happens in the neurons? And we can imagine three possible adaptation strategies to respond to this kind of perturbation. So remember, monkeys trying to push the, uh, push the cursor to hit a target over here. 
And initially what he does is he recruits cells that have preferred directions to point over here, half of which we decode correctly, and the result is a movement that's off up and to the right. So one thing he could do to adapt to this is to re-aim. Let's say he aims at a virtual target that's located down here. And then he recruits the neurons that have preferred directions that point towards that virtual target, half of which, again, we, we decode incorrectly, and that results in a straight movement towards the actual target. So we call this compensation re-aiming. It's a global strategy because he doesn't have to identify the cells that we perturbed. It applies to all cells equally. But it's not very efficient because when he applies this, uh, this strategy, you'll notice that the decoded cells still are dispersed. And so this strategy alone will compensate for that visual motor gain reduction. There are other strategies he could use to compensate. So for example, if these cells here are causing noise in the trajectory, what he could do is he could just simply stop modulating those cells with movement direction. He could shut them down. We call that re-weighting. Right? Re-weighting, and if he shuts them down, those neurons will stop contributing to the population vector algorithm, and that'll also result in a straightening of the trajectory. All right? So re-weighting is a local strategy. He has to identify the cells that we perturbed and selectively shut them down. And it's also not very efficient when the population of perturbed cells is large, because if he shuts them all down, he's left with fewer cells to control that cursor. So it's only efficient when the number of perturbed cells is small. But it's a possible strategy that he could use. The third strategy he could use is something we call remapping. All right. And so the idea behind remapping is that if these neurons are forcing the cursor to move north, what he could do is learn to just use those neurons when he wants the cursor to move north. Or, said another way, if he's trying to make a movement towards his target, he needs to recruit the population of cells that have preferred directions that point towards that target and that we have not perturbed. And he has to recruit the population of cells that have preferred directions that point south and that we have perturbed. And he can combine those two groups, and that results in the most efficient movement towards the target. So this remapping is again a local strategy. He has to identify the cells that we perturbed, and then he has to learn how the algorithm is assigning them to cursor direction. He has to start using them according to how that algorithm defines them. <coughs> so which one of these strategies does the subject actually use? Well, he definitely uses re-aiming. And the way we assess this is we take the firing rates of the cells, and we can perform a maximum likelihood estimate to find the aiming direction that best corresponds to those firing rates. And when we do that, what we find is that if these black pluses here represent the target directions, the blue ends of these arcs represent the aiming directions we measure during the control session before we apply the perturbation. And those aiming directions are always very close to the target. That's good. That's, uh, that's how, what we expect to be. And after we apply a perturbation in the clockwise direction, what we measure are that the aiming directions rotate. That's represented by the red ends of those arrows, they ro uh, arcs. They rotate in the counterclockwise direction to compensate. And similarly, if we apply the perturbation in the counterclockwise direction, we see those re-aiming points move in the clockwise direction. So he uses that re-aiming strategy. But it's not the only strategy he uses. He also uses that re-weighting strategy. To assess this, what we do is we measure the dynamic range of those cells, those modulation depths, in the control session before we apply that perturbation. And then we measure them again after he's adapted to the perturbed decoder. And we compare the sizes of those dynamic ranges. Now, under conditions in which we rotated 50% of the cells, it turns out there's no difference in the change in those modulation depths between the rotated group of cells and the non-rotated group of cells. All right? That's what's shown here on the bottom plot. But for experiments in which we only rotated 25% of the cells, what we find is that the cells that we rotate tend to have smaller modulation depths at the end of adaptation than the cells that we didn't rotate. So he does shut them down relative to the control population. Now this is really interesting because remember we said that re-weighting only makes sense when the number of perturbed cells is small because if you use that strategy you're left with a smaller group of cells with which to control the cursor. And it looks like he only uses the re-weighting strategy when the percentage of perturbed cells is small. And the final thing we did was assess remapping. And the way we assess remapping is by measuring the preferred directions of these neurons after he's adapted to the cursor. And we compare the preferred directions of those 
perturbed neurons, the ones that we fiddled with, to the preferred directions of the control population. And the question here is, do the preferred directions of that perturbed population rotate more than the control population? And the answer is that across almost every one of the experiments that we ran, that turns out to be the case. It's a relatively small effect between 5 and 10 degrees, but it's statistically significant in almost all cases. And so the monkey is able to solve this credit assignment problem to some effect. He's able to identify the the subset of cells that we perturbed, and he's able to selectively change their tuning curves. Now the question is, how much of the overall cursor error is, res is responsible, uh, is compensated for by these different mechanisms? How much of that error is compensated for by these global processes of re-aiming, and how much is compensated for by these retuning things, these re-weighting and the remapping? And it turns out we can compute that by playing around with little models where if you were only to re-aim, how much error would there be in the cursor? Or if you were to only change those tuning curves, how much error would be in the cursor? And the answer is that roughly 85% of the error reductions we see during adaptation are due to these global processes, re-aiming. And roughly 15%, still statistically significant, but relatively small of those errors are due to those retuning processes. Over the course of 200 trials, so we've now done an experiment in which we've held the same set of neurons for five weeks. And we applied a perturbation on day one, and we held that perturbation on. We held it on for the first 24 days, and then we turned it off. And we just wanted to see what would this re-aiming versus retuning effect do over time. And so what I'm showing here are the changes in preferred directions of the two groups of neurons. The unperturbed group is here in blue, and the perturbed group in, is in red. And if you look at the difference in those perturbed direction, preferred directions, that's that credit assignment effect. He's identifying that perturbed group, and he's rotating their preferred directions more. And what you'll notice is that that credit assignment effect grows steadily over time. It starts to saturate around 18 days in. Okay? So that local retuning appears to accumulate over time to actually account for a significant portion of the error. But you'll notice that he never actually asymptotes to the correct spot. The correct spot would be where that blue curve on the top goes all the way to zero, and that red curve goes all the way to the amount those cells were really rotated. And he never quite get there, gets there. So to summarize the learning processes part of this talk, subjects adapt very well to the visual motor rotations that we apply through brain-computer interfaces but they don't appear to adapt very well to the visual motor speed changes. And that's interesting because in natural reaching, we adapt to those visual motor speed changes very well. So there's something going on with the BCI process which makes that harder to do. And we see two neural correlates of this adaptation. The first is this global process I described, this re-aiming process, which seems to be responsible for short time scale error correction or reducing bias in the system. And the second is this local retuning process, initially small, but accumulates over time. And this could be what's uh, responsible for, say, the increase in linearity and tuning curves that we observe over a course of a month while the subject learns to use a device. All right, so that was the first part of the talk. And now I'm going to switch gears. And I'm going to talk, we've talked a lot about sort of how this closed loop system might differ from our expectations because the monkey is engaged in learning. And now I want to talk about how we might be able to design a new decoding algorithm to uh, help improve cursor control, um, where we have to be a little bit more flexible about our design strategy, have to think outside the box a little bit. So the state of the art decoder in neural prosthetics today is a Kalman filter. And the way a Kalman filter works is you, so you have two equations. You have your observation equation and you have your state evolution equation. So the idea is that we're trying to estimate the monkey's intended velocity of the cursor. All right? And we assume that our measurements, the firing rates y, are linearly related to those velocities. That's the observation equation. And part of the Kalman filter also has a description of how those velocities ought to unfold over time. Specifically, they ought to be smooth. So the velocity on any given time step ought to be pretty close to the velocity on the last time step. And what we do in the Kalman filter typically is we assume that that's a random walk process where the velocity on this time step is going to be centered on the velocity of the last time constant with some, uh, last time step with some noise around it. Now most of the 
approaches to improving this algorithm in the literature today focus on the observation equation, focus on coming up with a better model for how firing rates relate to velocity that accounts for the nonlinearities in the system, accounts for the fact that neurons are Poisson noise processes as opposed to Gaussian noise processes, these sorts of things. I'm not going to talk about that work today. I'm instead going to talk about our efforts to improve the prior model. So it might be the case that these random walk models are not appropriate for how we actually, certainly not appropriate for how we actually move our arms. And they may not be appropriate for how we actually move cursors around on computer screens. So here's an example. Uh, this is a video that you might see in sort of any conference talking about neural prosthetics. This is common filter decoding. The movements look pretty good. They're relatively straight to the targets. The movement time is less than 900 milliseconds, and, uh, which includes the reaction time. What this video doesn't show you is that the subjects are actually really terrible at stopping. They can move the cursor to the target very well. But when it comes to stopping and holding the cursor on that target, they do miserably. So what we've done in this experiment, we've just increased the amount of hold time he needs for success. And the amount of hold time on any given trial is given by that white bar, and the amount that he, he actually does is given by the slider that moves up. And you'll see that in the majority of these trials, when the monkey is using that cursor, he's just blowing through the target. All right? And that's a disaster for when we're trying to really design uh, a device that patients can use in the real world. Because what this means is that if I have a robotic arm, and I'm trying to go up to you and shake your hand, 16, 10 out of 16 times, I'm going to just punch you right in the stomach. All right? And these patients have enough problems without being known as stomach punchers. All right? so, our first question we want to ask is, why is speed so poorly controlled in our brain-computer interface devices? All right. We can think of sort of two explanations. The first is that speed just might be poorly represented in the neural populations that we can record from. That's a possibility. The second is that speed could be in those populations. It just might be encoded in some complicated way so that we're not extracting it with our algorithms. And so to address this question, we wanted to look at the speed representation during natural reaching movements. The way we do this, we have a, a rhesus macaque monkey. Uh, he's implanted, in this case, with two Utah rays that we're recording from in motor and premotor cortex. And he's engaged in this 3D center outreaching task. So it's the task that I've been talking about. He moves from the center of a workspace to a target on the outside, except in this case, he's doing it in three dimensions. And what we wanted to do was compare how much information these neurons are carrying about speed and about direction. Of course, this is a difficult thing to do because speed is a scalar quantity and direction is a vector. Right? So how do we do it? So the way we do it is we discretize both speed and direction into 26 bins, uh, 26 equally populated bins. So we, what we do is we discretize it into entropy match distributions. And then we take the spike counts recorded from our neurons in 30 millisecond bins, which is the bin width we use during decoding. And we just compare the mutual information between the spike counts and the speed discretized into these bins. And we compare the mutual information between the spike counts and the direction discretized in these bins. And when we do that, what we find is that in individual neurons, we get far more information about direction than we do about speed. All right. Yeah. How do you tell the, how do you like convey to the monkey that uh, he has to hold at the at the you know, target? I mean, is it possible that 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 isn't become clear to the monkey? Yeah. So what we do is we don't give him a reward until he's held for the right amount of time, and so he's just got to hold there until he gets his reward. So the fact that it's slightly more complex than the other task mm -hmm. could that be one of the things that's biasing your result? Uh, possibly, um, but um, we've run it for several days and he never seems to get better at it. And, uh, and, and so, and we know he's trying to get better at it because of the strategies that he'll take. So if there happens to be some kind of speed bias in the system, he'll approach the target from the low speed side so that he can go through it more slowly. So I think it's not that he doesn't understand what's required of him. He understands it's just a, a serious lack of ability in the decoder. Yeah. So when we do this mutual information analysis on individual neurons, what we find is that they carry more information about direction than they do about speed, individual neurons. The question is, how about at the population level? And so to assess it at the population level, we designed Poisson naive Bayes classifiers. And we applied them to the population response. And we saw how well we're able to predict 
uh, which speed of the 26 possible discretized values and which direction that the, subject, that the arm was actually moving at. And even in these population responses, what we find is that we're able to correctly classify the direction about three times more accurately than we're able to classify the speed. All right. So what it looks like is at least in our neural population, speed just might be not very well represented. So this is a problem for decoding because even if we design a coder to maximally extract speed, the information just might not be there. So what do we do now? And so our idea was that maybe we can use direction to control speed. We know he controls direction very well. Maybe we can multiplex the directional signal to not just control the direction of the cursor, but to also control its speed. And the way we do that is by futzing around with the state evolution equation of the Kalman filter. All right. So typically in a Kalman filter, all right, we have this, it sets up the prior for the system. The velocity that you're going to estimate on the, on, on the next time step is constrained to be somewhat in the vicinity of the velocity that's estimated on this time step. And typically, that matrix A, we use the identity matrix, which means the velocity ought to be centered on the velocity at the last time step. Well, what we do is we apply a speed dampening factor. And we make A a, a variable over time where it's proportional to the identity matrix with some constant that varies between 0 and 1. Now, when that constant is 1, we get that standard Kalman filter. The velocity estimate is centered on the velocity at the last time step. But when lambda is less than 1, that velocity estimate is shrunk. The average value in your prior is going to be a little bit shorter than the value it was on the last time step. And that, what that results is in a slower movement vector on average. And the way we set lambda is we take a page, turns out in natural reaching movements, when you go to make a curved movement, you move more slowly than when you're making a straight movement. It's called the two-thirds power law of natural reaching. And so what we say is we compute the curvature in the movement by looking at the delta change in direction over time. And the larger the curvature, the decoded curvature, the slower we make the cursor. So that we make these highly curved movements, corrective movements, the cursor slows down. And we make lambda sort of inversely proportional to that. All right, and then we tested this out online because, um, and so the way we tested it out, we have that rhesus macaque implanted now, just one Utah array in primary motor cortex. We're taking spike counts now from roughly about 85 neurons, again in these 30 millisecond bins, and he's supposed to do this center out brain computer interface, uh, interface cursor task, where now the hold time is randomly distributed. It could be zero milliseconds, or it could be all the way up to 600 milliseconds. All right. And again, he just has to hold the cursor on that target until he gets the reward. When we do this with a Kalman filter, this is what his success rate plots. As the hold, if the hold times are very short, he's very good at this task. But as those hold times get long, he does very poorly at this. That's well under 50% success rate. But with the speed dampening and Kalman filter, he does much, much better. So for hold times that are roughly around 300 milliseconds, he's doing about twice as well as the Kalman filter. And what that, oh, so one trivial way to achieve this result is just if we slow the cursor down on average, all right? Because if it's slower on average, he ought to be more accurate, all right? And what we did is we quantified the actual movement time, how long it takes him to acquire the target, uh, and uh, which includes the reaction time. We measured it, compared it between the speed dampening Kalman filter and the standard Kalman filter, and we saw there was no difference. So we haven't slowed the cursor down. Instead, we've just pushed the accuracy up. So this is what the speed dampening Kalman filter looks like online. So you'll see that the monkey has uh, more ability to hold that on the target. And, uh, and a lot of times, what you'll see is what he's really trying to do under both the Kalman filter and this filter is that when he gets that cursor onto the target, he tries to scribble it around to keep it inside the overlap area consistent with success. And right now, we're taking those natural corrective movements that he makes, and we're actually using that as a signal that that cursor ought to move slowly. And so in this case, out of the 16 trials that we perform, we get 13 successes. Now, I should emphasize that if we use this new algorithm to try and predict natural arm movement, so we record from neurons in motor cortex while monkeys are making natural reaching movements, and we try and predict where the arm was at any given time, it performs miserably. All right? The Kalman filter significantly outperforms this thing offline. And again, what this tells us is that those algorithms that enable superior online control are not necessarily those algorithms that give the best 
decoding results offline. All right, so to summarize that speed dampening Kalman filter portion of this work, we found that direction is more reliably encoded in the neurons that we're recording from than speed is, and that our SDKF decoding algorithm outperforms the Kalman filter in closed loop BCI, mainly because his corrective movements now act as a break on the cursor. And we think that this captures a little bit more accurately the natural speed curvature trade-off that's found in movement. All right. More generally, the result is that you can use these high fidelity neural signals, like what's carried about direction, and you can multiplex off of them to actually control multiple dimensions of a device, both direction and speed in this case. So some conclusions. First off, subject learning is the key to good neural prosthetic control. All right. All of our algorithms right now assume linearity. And it turns out that's OK because neurons can develop linear tuning over time. Also, subjects can compensate for any inherent biases in decoders. And they do it very, very rapidly within the course of a trial. Algorithms that predict our movements are not always the best algorithms for online control. And to design better prosthetic devices, we need, first off, a better understanding of the limitations in that learning process. So this retuning analysis is very, very slow. Are there ways that we can speed it up? And he's very bad at adapting to speed gains in the system. Are there, why is that? Can we understand what the limitations are there and work around? It? And second off, we need a more flexible design strategy. We need to start thinking outside the box, thinking about classes of biased algorithms that might actually work better than their unbiased counterparts, that sort of thing. So I've been throwing around the word we a lot in this presentation. So I just want to, this is the acknowledgments. This is who I mean when I say we on the University of Pittsburgh side. I, uh, it's with Andy Schwartz group where I did my postdoc. And people under him were uh, responsible for most uh, of the learning processes work. On the Carnegie Mellon side, I've worked most with uh, Rob Cass. And, and for the speed dampening Kalman filter work, the bulk of that was done by our student, Matt Golub, and, uh, and his co-advisor, Byron Neal. And then our funding sources, of course. Thank you. Um, the brain normally does speed control. So is it that there's another brain region which is representing speed better, or is there some kind of piggybacking? Yeah, I'm going to say not much is known about how the, speed, how the brain does normal speed control. Uh, so probably the most thorough study of speed representation, at least in primary motor cortex, was done by uh, Mark Churchland and Krishna Shinoy. And what they found is that when you're making movements, these center out movements at one speed, you get one set of neurons that are active. When you make them at a different speed, you get an entirely different set of neurons that are active, uh, which is a, a, a terrible scenario for our decoding <laughs> results. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you said you need to learn more about the limitations of learning. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, in terms of the, uh, identifying an upper bound for what you can learn, like if you just totally naively plunk some uh, you know, interface onto the motor cortex and hook it up to a brain, would I mean, eventually just learn to use it? Yeah. So it's a great question. It's one we'd love to try. The problem is that if he can't use it, he doesn't try. This is true for humans, too. There has to be some baseline level of success rate in order to even engage a subject in a task. So you have to start them out in a ballpark and have them engage with it, work with it, develop some control over it. We don't know what that ballpark means. We don't, you know, we don't know why it has to be there. We don't know if it's just because the subject won't engage with it, or is it just because that first decoder is so difficult it actually can't be learned? Are there only certain classes of decoders that are learnable and certain classes that can never be learned? We don't know. And we're working on ways to try and address that question. Yeah. So, so people have tried algorithms of various complexity. So the ones I'm directly familiar with are where we've taken that encoding model and and we've made it nonlinear to represent what neurons actually do, and we've put Poisson noise models on it, which are more accurately represent what they do, and they work a little better, 
5% better, maybe as much as 10% better, but it's not the kinds of gains that you'd expect to see in the system. Now, in terms of uh, uh, so people have done more complicated machine learning types of algorithms uh, where, say, support vector machines just try and classify what the next actual intended movement is based on what the movement is uh, on the last time step and do that rapidly enough to move trajectories through and do them in self-adaptive ways where the support vectors can adapt over time depending on which were more recently used and that sort of thing. And again, they work OK, but they haven't led to vast improvements in control. Uh, and it could just be that we haven't hit on the right algorithm yet. Uh, I'd argue we need a better understanding of the system so that we can guide our search to the right algorithm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you look at uh, surface level, for example, from uh, recordings like easy and not uh, by on neurons level, is there, uh, can we decode, it, uh, decode something from the surface level? Is there any more? Yeah, so we can absolutely decode stuff from the surface level. And people have done cursor control based on EEG. Uh, it looks like for EEG signals, it takes much longer to learn. Uh, so uh, subjects have to practice with the device for weeks to gain any kind of uh, proficiency with it. Uh, but it can be done. And so we don't know why the learning for EEG is slower than for when working with single neurons. It could be that the signal to noise ratio is lower, or it could be that it's more difficult to synchronize uh, enough neurons to actually generate a potential that's readoutable at the scalp. Um, but yes, uh, non-invasive methods have been used and, and, and will continue to be used, I think. And does it depend upon the complexity of tasks? For example, I would guess that uh, I mean, uh, aiming a cursor is much finer task than probably extending your hand just to do a handshake. So uh, <laughs> if the complexity is less, does it like affect uh, Decoding. Yeah, so one, one thing that people have used EEG signals for very successfully is to control spelling devices. And so it turns out you can make a category selection uh, using uh, what they call a P300 speller, which is an EEG device. And what they do is they flash letters on the screen until, and, and when you see the one that you want to use, there's a recognition signal that you can read out in the EEG. And so then it selects that one, and they can use spelling devices like that. So these sorts of categorization tasks tend to be simpler than the continuous control tasks I've been talking about. And there you can use EEG things. But yeah, as the complexity of the task scales up, it looks like we need high fidelity control signals. And so uh, people have never used EEG control to get good control much above two dimensions. Uh, and uh, these days, with neurons, uh, uh, human subjects are actually controlling robotic arms with about 10 degrees of freedom. Um, so uh, it looks like uh, single neurons just enable um, more complex control. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions that may, that may be naive, but um, it's the, the way I understand the, the detection algorithm is you've designed it to figure out what direction the monkey wants to move mm -hmm. the, the, the cursor. Um, and in, in order to get the monkey to be able to stop at the target, you've created a way to allow the monkey to sort of circle around or give, or give it a give it a sort of artificial stop cue. Yeah. Um, and so the first part of my question is, um, if you take one of your decoders, can you just get the monkey to maintain the cursor right at the origin where it starts, or is it always going to be moving mm -hmm. around? And then the follow-up question for that is, um, is there maybe some stop signal or decrease in um, general global neuronal activity that your decoder might, because it's averaging all of these uh, inputs, mm -hmm. think it's, it's just going to take the best, its best guess of the direction. Mm -hmm. but really, what the monkey's done is it's tried to sort of turn down all the neurons mm -hmm. to a baseline level, and it's just trying to tell the damn thing to stop. Yeah. Um, and so is there, is there a way that you could identify a stop signal mm -hmm. Um, and maybe use that instead or as a complement to this sort of mm -hmm. uh, more elaborate speed control mechanism. Sure. So to address your first question, is it can he hold the cursor steady in the center of the screen? The answer is it doesn't seem so. So we've tried that. We've tried not only peripheral targets, but where he has to make movements from peripheral targets into the center. And he's just as bad stabilizing in the center as he is at the periphery. Uh, for your second question of is there some uh, some signal about speed carried at the population level, the answer is there might be. Uh, but whatever it is, it's not 
carried in such a way that a Poisson naive base classifier can pull it out. All right. And the only assumption really that the Poisson naive base classifier is making, first off, it's assuming the neurons are Poisson, which is typically a pretty good assumption. But it's also assuming that the neurons are independent. But if that assumption holds true, it doesn't matter. It may not be linearly encoded or that sort of thing. Even if it's nonlinear speed firing rate relationship, that classifier ought to be pull, able to pull it out. And even then, we're not able to classify speed as well as direction. So it could be carried in, this, in the neuronal population. But if it is, it's violating uh, any of the sort of simple rules that, that we can work with. Uh, so there's, there's, another, there's another interesting twist to this problem, uh, which I didn't talk about. But it's a, the question is, what kind of signal ought we to expect in the brain related to speed? All right. So should a speed command signal look like the speed of the arm? So if the speed of the arm is bell-shaped, should the speed command signal be bell-shaped? And the answer is probably not, because the arm is a nonlinear actuator. All right. At the very least, it's a low-pass filter. All right. So if you feed in, whatever you feed in, you're going to get, it, at, at the least, a low-pass filter out. And the arm is actually much more nonlinear than that. So it could be that the command signals we're really looking for ought to have some different temporal shape than the actual speed of the arm. And we don't really know how to extract that. Um, so speed might be in these neural populations. But if it is, it's in some complex form that we, we, we can't access yet. All right, thanks, speaker. Thank you.